I'd like, if I may, to dedicate this lecture to our old and much missed friend, Charlie Truman. <clears throat> I hope Charlie... I hope Charlie would have enjoyed the fact that I've chosen to start with a visit to the movies. Rather an old movie, in fact. The Private Lives of Henry VIII, vintage 1933, and starring Charles Lawton. <clears throat> I'm told it was the first non-Hollywood film to win an Oscar, though not, I imagine, for the best table manners category, uh, as you will see. and no substance. Like one of Cromwell's speeches. <coughs> Just as difficult to swallow. Too many cooks, that's the trouble. Above stairs as well as below. Marry again? Breed more sons? Coarse brutes. There's no delicacy nowadays. No consideration for others. Refinement's a thing of the past. Well, it's great entertainment, and it probably is as much to form uh, the image of Henry in our age as Holbein's portrait did in his. In some ways, it made a pretty good stab at capturing the atmosphere of a Tudor banqueting hall. The general layout of the hall isn't wrong. It's richly hung with tapestries, as it would have been, the army of servers carrying in dishes is right, though perhaps not the frantic scurrying. And the clothes, or some of them, aren't bad either. But much of the rest is dead wrong. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, to score a few cheap points, the silver is a disaster. Henry would never have drunk at table out of a tankard and certainly not one made in Sweden, about 1700. <laughs> and the, the massive uh, salt um, half out of the frame is the Mostyn salt, reassuringly English, but half a century too young. You might even have noticed a few 18th century English tankards in the clip too. Worse still, Henry seems to be eating his capon off a plate made of pewter whereas anything less than gold would have been a severe breach of protocol. But perhaps most wrong is in representing the king as a belching, chicken-bone, flinging slob, for, for he was no such thing. Uh, nor would he have had any reason to say, refinement's a thing of the past. Henry's banquets were impressive displays of wealth, culture, and manners, staged to leave observers in no doubt that his court was as refined as any. And in this sense, they had the desired result. In 1517, a visiting Italian concluded his description of a banquet by saying, the wealth and civilization of the world are here, and those who call the English barbarians appear to me to render themselves as such. Now, I'm going to try and do several things in this lecture. First, I want to look at just one of the many contemporary accounts of these magnificent events. Then I'll turn to the protocols and customs that govern them. And finally, I'll explore what some of these magnificent and mostly vanished wares look like. 
For despite the superb and costly tapestries, the rich clothes and the abundant food and wine, it was the plate that always made people's jaws drop. One of Henry's most celebrated banquets was held in 1527 uh, in Greenwich for the French ambassadors who were here to sign yet another of those doomed treaties of perpetual and undying amity. It was witnessed by Edward Hall and recorded at great length uh, in his chronicle. And part of what he wrote is this. The king caused a great banquet house to be made. The roof was purple cloth full of roses and pomegranates, and this house was richly hanged with tapestry. And therein was raised a cupboard of seven stages high and 13 foot long, set with standing cups, bowls, <coughs> flagons, and great pots, all of fine gold. Some were garnished with one stone and some with other stones and pearls. And on the other side was another cupboard of nine stages high, set full of high pots, flagons, and bowls, all massy plate of silver and gilt, so high and so broad, it was a marvel. In his description of the meal, he tells us that the king, the queen, and the princess Mary were each served from their own serving board, each of which was groaning with gold plate. So great, he says, that every lord grudged to bear them. He then describes the architectural features of the pop-up banqueting hall and recounts how, after the first two courses, the entire company moved into a separate space where they witnessed the entremet, a series of elaborate disguisings and musical entertainments. These disguisings were an essential part of the event. They were spectacular, expensive, and politically charged. Hall's account concentrates on the gilded decorations and the painted signs of the zodiac on the ceiling, while the Venetian ambassador, also present, focuses on the entertainment itself, with its allegorical and classical allusions and its costly cloth of gold costumes decorated with gold ornaments called spangles. Huge sums were spent on these little jewels, and many were lost during the course of the dancing. Finally, they passed back into the dining hall for the closing course known as the voidi, or spice. This was a bit like uh, dessert, but in Ivan Day's sense of dessert, uh, and consisted of delicate comfits uh, and sweet wine called hippocras, all of which was served with great ceremony. Hall's eyes, uh, as we heard, fell first on the buffets, which were always a showstopper. A state banquet, um, for example, in 1517, um, when we read about that, we read that there was a buffet set out 30 feet in length, 20 feet high, that's about 9 by 6 metres, with silver vases and vases of gold worth vast treasure. Well, the buffet, and we heard a little bit about this from, from Tim um, earlier, and indeed from Catherine, the buffet was a, a long-established feature of European aristocratic dining. It served a practical purpose as a sideboard, where plate needed for the meal could be parked, but it was also a means of displaying wealth and hence power. Here are two uh, late 15th century buffets, one on an Italian uh, Cassoni panel and the other in a Tournai tapestry. In 15th century Burgundy, buffets were marks of rank as well as wealth, and rules were drawn up to regulate how many shelves you were allowed depending on who you were. But on Tudor state occasions, their scale was extraordinary. To give you an idea of the impression of the 1517 display, let's look, as we have already today, at the, 15, the 1838 painting of uh, George IV's Grand Service, uh, shown on display at Windsor Castle, on a structure that measured about 20 feet wide by 13 feet high. And I'm grateful to Catherine Jones for giving me those figures. Um, on this basis, the 1517 display measuring 30 feet by 20, if the numbers are to be believed, would have filled the entire wall. An important feature of the buffet of state was that it was purely for display. The author of that account was at pains to report not only that it was worth vast treasure, 
but that none of it was touched. Similar observations appear in most of these accounts. And they're worth making because they emphasise the fact that there was plenty more where that came from. Now, it's a, it's a great shame that we have no images of these displays to match those we know from Italy and Burgundy. But what we lack in pictures is more than made up, not only by eyewitness accounts, but also by a remarkable document called the Northumberland Ceremonial. This is in the Bodleian Library, and it dates from about 1500. It sets out detailed instructions for much of the ceremonial performed at the Earl of Northumberland's household. It prescribes, for example, the setting out of the show buffet for one of the most important feasts of the year, Twelfth Night at the end of Christmas. According to this, the vessels on the first stage should all be pots, on the second, flagons, on the third, bowls, on the fourth, goblets, and on the fifth, standing cups. Well, I've tried to reconstruct what such a buffet could have looked like, and here it is. It includes plate only associated with drink, pots, flagons, bowls, and cups. And while this may not always have been stuck to, indeed it certainly wasn't stuck to in the two continental images we've looked at, interestingly, it's exactly the setup described at the 1527 Greenwich banquet with pots, flagons, bowls, uh, goblets, and then standing cups on the top. Feasts, feasts such as these were great events. They were complex and multi-layered and appealed to most of the senses. Taste, obviously. Sight, through the plate, the tapestries, and the spectacle. Hearing and the intellect through music and other entertainments. And it was quite normal for them to last up to four hours or more, largely because of the elaborate ceremony that attended almost every stage. Another tapestry, supposedly representing the biblical feast of Azuarius, gives a good flavour of this. Um, although, with everything seeming to happen at once and creating, therefore, rather uh, a chaotic impression. Now, this uh, tapestry is in the Cathedral of Zaragoza uh, in Spain, and I just happened to be there uh, a couple of weeks ago, and so my smartphone was kept quite busy. Um, although photography was strictly forbidden. And um, <laughs> when at one point I did get caught out, um, <clears throat> by the man he came up to me and he said, excuse me, sir, photography is not possible here. And my friend who was with me was very tempted to say, well, actually, it is possible. <laughs> um, so I apologized profusely. I sloped away to another gallery. And then when nobody was looking, I came back and finished. So that will become quite useful later on in the lecture. Um, in this tapestry, the king is sitting at the epicenter. The buffet is on the right, uh, and the musicians are on the left. And quantities of food are being borne in on uh, silver dishes by a whole constant stream of servants coming in stage left, as it were. At center front, uh, a servant kneels, and a gentleman, uh, perhaps a, a nobleman, performs the assay. This was the ritual tasting of food before it was offered to the king. And another servant stands behind him uh, with a covered cup waiting for the wine to be similarly tested. This was done at every stage with every kind of food and drink, even with the salt and even with the water that was used for washing. A great banquet would normally start with the ritual hand washing and a vivid description of this appears in the Venetian ambassador's description of a banquet that was laid on for the Emperor Charles V uh, in Canterbury in May 1520. And the whole thing clearly fascinated um, the author. It's, it's quite complicated, so please listen very carefully. The emperor and the king and queen of England washed together by themselves. The Duke of Suffolk brought a large gold basin with a cover bearing a crown in the center of which was a small cup. And when this had been removed by the Duke of Buckingham, the Marquis of Brandenburg's brother took off the cover, holding it under the basin borne by the, as you'll remember, Duke of Suffolk. Whereupon the Duke of Buckingham gave the water in the cup to the Duke of Suffolk to drink, who, having made the assay, then poured the water from his basin, which had an aperture 
or mouth at the side over the hands of the sovereign to whom the brother of the Count Palatine of the Rhine presented the towel. <laughs> well, what did these strange-sounding vessels look like? Well, actually, we can get a pretty good idea from a silver gilt basin of 1492 at Corpus Christi College, Oxford, which is on loan at the Ashmolean. This was given to the college by its founder, Bishop Richard Fox, and it has just such a little aperture or mouth at the side. As important as the ritual itself was who performed it. In this case, you have the monarchs being waited on by two English dukes and two German noblemen. And this was standard procedure on such a great occasion. At the 1527 Greenwich banquet, Hall wrote that the weight of the gold plate for the king's table, I've read it already, was so great that every lord grudged to bear them. In other words, the lords were serving the royal tables. And in 1501, at a banquet made to mark the uh, arrival of Catherine of Aragon in this country, the voidy was brought in by earls, barons, knights, and men of honor. Cardinal Wolsey occasionally tried to press the nobility into performing such roles at his own banquets, and it did not go down very well. The bringing in and assay of each course would have been similarly ceremonial. As an example, the Northumberland ceremonial gives detailed instructions for the voidy. This uh, was served on imposing spice plates uh, and with covered cups uh, as a further mark of status. A gentleman to bring in a covered, this is how the instructions go, a gentleman to bring in a covered spice plate to the cupboard for the Lord and another for the lady, with three gentlemen to serve the Lord and three more to wait upon the lady. The instructions are for them both to come in together, or almost, for provided that my Lord's spice plate have the preeminence somewhat before my lady's. Other uncovered spice plates are to be provided for the rest of the company. The ceremony continues with ever-increasing complexity. A gentleman takes off the cover of the Lord's spice plate and passes it to his colleague. He then takes the assay and then steps to the Lord with it, and when the Lord hath done, in other words, helped himself, he then to cover it again and retreat back and stand still. Then the cup bearer to step forward with the cup. He uncovers it and takes the assay, covers it again, and then uncovers and proffers it. There's another uh, detail from the uh, very helpful tapestry in Zaragoza. And as the Lord drinketh, he is to hold the cup of assay under the cup, and when he hath drunken, to cover it again, and then to retreat back into the Lord's, unto the Lord's spice plate. Then he that holds the towel, to proffer it to the Lord, to wipe his mouth. The process is then repeated for the lady, and then for the rest of the company. And all this took time, a great deal of time, and is faintly echoed, but only faintly by the loving cup ritual that still takes place in certain livery company dinners to this day. Spice plates are interesting. By Elizabethan times, they were exactly that, plates or dishes, although they were more elaborately decorated than others. Uh, a set in the v &A, made for Lord Burley is superbly engraved with biblical and maritime scenes. But in the early 16th century and before, they took a variety of forms. Several with covers in the 1520 Royal Inventory weighed well over 100 ounces each and were enriched with enamel or sculptural details. A hundred years earlier, Henry IV had one made of jasper with silver gilt and enameled mounts and another set with gemstones and pearls. It's significant that all the uncovered spice dishes in the 1520 Royal Inventory were gilded whereas none of the silver or parcel gilt ones had covers. Hierarchy again. None of these great early spice plates survives, but it's possible that a few slightly less grand ones do, although not previously recognized as such. The Northumberland ceremonial refers to carrying the spice plate by its stalk, so presumably they generally had stems, in which case 
it seems more than possible that a pair of shallow covered bowls uh, in the British Museum and a single uncovered one at Goldsmiths Hall, always known as cups or bowls, are in fact spice plates. Covered cups have survived marginally better than covered spice plates, and those that have come down to us show a remarkable degree of innovation and variety uh, in their design. Any one of these would have not looked out of place uh, in the 1527 Greenwich Banquet, I would say. Moving on to some of the other plate associated with these ceremonies, let's look again at the Azuarius Tapestry uh, and again at the Northumberland Ceremonial. On and around the table um, are plates with exotic food, are, are, are plate, plates with exotic food, two nefs, covered cups, <laughs> and most significantly, a set of carving knives and a covered salt. The nef, or ship model, was a medieval form, and it was passing out of fashion in early 16th century England, and there were none in Henry VIII's jewel house. But the other pieces in the tapestry would all have been quite familiar to an English audience. The ceremonial sets out the rules for laying the table. The cupboards um, to be covered with carpets and with tablecloths of diaper. Um, that's exactly, incidentally, as you see in the tapestry, there is the tablecloth of diaper and there is the underlying uh, carpet. The, uh, the Lord's table should have a great standing salt of gold or silver gilt with two small salts of gold for the assay, a spoon of gold, and a pair of carving knives, hasted, handled that is, with silver and gilt. And the lady's board was to be laid in the same way. The lord to have none to sit at his board that day, this is Twelfth Night, um, other than his eldest son or a baron. The main cast here then are the spoon, the salt, and the carving knives. Henry's inventory includes many silver spoons, but a small number of gold ones too, including one with a ruby at the end and another with a diamond. A jeweled gold spoon would have been a very special mark of status, as we shall see, and probably only for the use of the king or the queen. Carving for the Lord's table was no uh, menial task, uh, and carving knives like uh, these three in the tapestry, were elaborately decorated. Carving was a sophisticated performance. Manuals were written explaining how to do it, and it was normally done by a senior officer or, in the royal household, a nobleman, who, according to the ceremonial, was to make his entrance in procession, preceded by a yeoman usher, a yeoman with a torch, and the marshal and the almoner. In this famous image from the Tre Richeur of the Duke de Berry, this office is being performed by the richly dressed gentleman uh, in the court in the foreground. The key pieces on the table, however, uh, the key piece on the table was the great salt. Pick up almost any popular book on silver and you'll read the same story. Salt was a rare and costly commodity, and for this reason, salt sellers were large and splendid things. This is a myth. Please forget it. In the 15th century, we imported large quantities of salt to run our substantial fish curing industry. And how could we possibly have done that if it was rare and costly? Yet there's no denying that the great salt was indeed very large and very splendid. One of the most uh, impressive surviving medieval salts is the so-called giant salt uh, from New College, New, from All Souls College, Oxford, uh, which is also on loan at the Ashmolean. The salt container itself is made of rock crystal and the base is decorated with enamel. But compared with most of the grandest in the royal household, it was quite modest. Henry VIII's star term gold salt cellar was probably the Morris Dance salt, which weighed 147 ounces. It was designed as a woman holding the crystal salt cellar above her head uh, and surrounded by five Morris dancers. Not only that, but it was enriched with settings of diamonds and pearls. If not a symbol of conspicuous wealth then, why was the great salt so great? 
The real reason is that salt was a symbol of purity. Leviticus refers to the salt of the covenant with God and says that with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Ezekiel tells us that rubbing with salt was part of the ritual cleansing of a newborn child. And in pre-Reformation baptism, consecrated salt was placed in the mouth of the infant to, and I love this bit, to signify the spiritual salt, which is the word of God, wherewith he should be seasoned, that the filthy savour of stinking sin should be taken away. There was, therefore, a definite religious undertow to this focus on salt. And if we scratch the surface, we find it running through much of the ceremony of dining too. Ablutions, the hierarchy of vessels, the removing and replacing of cup covers, the assay, and so on. Great feasts were often preceded by great church services, and the feast was, in a sense, the secular equivalent of the mass. The ritual washing was a mirror image of the ablutions at the start of the mass, and the voidy, with its sweet wine and spice, sometimes called wafers, must have had more than a Eucharistic resonance. The uh, shallow bowls or spice plates at Goldsmiths Hall uh, and in the British Museum uh, are both engraved with religious inscriptions uh, in Latin. Blessed be God for all his gifts and his sanctity in everything, on one, and blessed be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, on the other. Returning to the hierarchy, a particularly telling instance uh, of this occurs in the Count's of the Field of Cloth of Gold, Henry's extraordinarily extravagant summit with Francis I in northern France in 1520. Here, for two weeks, both monarchs vied to outdo each other in brilliant tournaments, staggering entertainments, and general magnificence. And it was on the banquets with which they entertained each other that this magnificence was primarily focused. On one occasion, when the monarchs dined together, an observer noted that Amongst other remarkable things at this display were two cupboards, on one of which were many vessels of massive gold and set with beautiful jewels. And from these vases, the king and queen were served. On the other cupboard were vases, also of massive gold, but not set with jewels, and these were served for the other guests at the royal table. There was, besides, an infinite number of silver gilt vases. So here, then, is another tier of hierarchy for the king and queen, gold enriched with precious stones. For the other members of the inner circle, gold. And for the rest, mere silver gilt. King uh, Azuarius's gold cup, in this detail, uh, is set with gemstones on the finial. Just as ritual cleansing and the service of food were governed by rules, so were the seating arrangements though these varied according to the nature of the occasion. On Twelfth Night, or a coronation banquet, custom required that the king or queen should be seated alone, but on others, not. On one occasion, the Venetian ambassador tells us that the king sat between Catherine of Aragon and his sister, who were flanked by the imperial ambassador and Wolsey. But perhaps times were changing, because he sounds a little surprised when he says that the ladies indeed sat alternately, that is to say, a gentleman and then a lady. The lower tables were carefully ordered too. The Northumberland ceremonial decrees separate tables, one for the chamberlain and his officers, one for the steward and his officers, and one for the dean of chapel. And each had its own subtle hierarchy. Uncovered salts for all and 12 spoons, but guilt for the chamberlain and the steward and parcel guilt for the dean. Uh, food and drink was designed to appeal as much to the eye as to the palate, uh, more so quite possibly. But to discuss their huge variety and elegant, elaborate presentation would need uh, a lecture by itself. Um, as Edward Hall says in his account of the Greenwich Banquet, to rehearse the fare, the strangeness of the dishes, the devices of beasts and fowls, it were too long. I know how he felt. But we get a slightly more helpful hint from the papal nuncio in 1517, who tells us that every imaginable sort of meat and fish was served, but the jellies surpassed everything. They were made in the shape of castles and of animals of various descriptions, as beautiful and admirable as can be imagined. 
He goes on to say that the removal and replacing of dishes the whole time was incessant, the hall in every direction being full of fresh viands on their way to the table. Yet again, uh, we get a strong hint of this um, from the tapestry. In contrast to the diversity of ceremonial vessels, like cups, salts, and spice plates, the wares in which most of the food was brought to the table was quite simple. Limited to sets of dishes known as garnishes, they came in a range of sizes, but a single basic design. None of these sets survive from before the late 16th century, but they would not have been very different from a late Elizabethan set of 26 dishes that was excavated in the 19th century uh, and is now in the British Museum. Henry's 1520 inventory lists enormous uh, numbers of what it terms vessel, uh, which were evidently supplied in sets of 38 pieces comprising two charges, 12 platters, 12 dishes, and 12 saucers, each set of 38 weighing around 1,100 ounces. In all, the inventory lists about 980 of these dishes of various sizes, weighing a total of some 21,000 ounces. None of these had covers, so food was kept warm on its journey to the table by means of inverting one dish uh, on top of the other, uh, as you can see from this detail from a 17th century French banquet. There are similar 16th century images as well, but I didn't have such a good slide of those. The uh, reason for such large numbers of dishes was that the service was served in the way that later came to be known as the service à la Française. Everything on offer for that course was placed on a set of dishes known as a mess, with each mess shared between several people. At one of the banquets held for Catherine of Aragon in 1501, there were 12 dishes at the first course, 15 at the second, and 18 at the third. Henry VIII would not have been pleased to be served a lone capon, uh, even on a gold plate. Drink is more complicated. Contemporary sources frequently describe the rituals associated with drink on several occasions, as we've seen. Uh, and this is supported by an oft-quoted later 16th century source in which we're told that uh, drinking bowls of silver in noblemen's houses are seldom set upon the table, but each one, as necessity urgeth, calleth for a cup of such drink as him listeth to have, so that when he's tasted of it, he delivereth the cup again to someone of the standers by, who, making it clean by pouring out the drink that remaineth, restoreth it to the cupboard from whence he fetched the same. And it's interesting to see in Ivan Day's lecture that something not dissimilar still seemed to be um, practiced in the provinces uh, in the, during the 18th century. But some of the visual sources we looked at earlier suggest otherwise. Um, this Tournay tapestry of about 1500 uh, shows the assembled company all merrily imbibing away, and no one seems to be poised to take away their cups. But perhaps they are. And a, there are certainly more beakers and bowls standing by ready uh, on, on the buffet. You can see them stacked up on the bottom uh, shelf of the buffet there. An important difference here is that these are not ceremonial covered cups, but much more uh, modest bowls uh, and beakers, uh, rather like this, uh, a beaker in the Gilbert collection in V&A. Well, to have these detailed descriptions of Henry VIII's banquets and their plethora of plate is one thing, but knowing what they look like is another. Upwards of a thousand items or sets of gold and silver are listed in Henry VIII's 1520 inventory, but just two pieces are known to have survived from that early part of his reign, and only one that was actually made for the king. The very beautiful gold cup on the left-hand side is in the British Museum. It's among the pieces that Henry inherited, and it had been made originally for the Duke de Berry in about 1400. But the other piece in the Church of San Lorenzo in Florence has London hallmarks of 1511, two years into the reign, and was presumably a royal commission. 
Like many pieces in the inventory, it's decorated with red and white roses and pomegranates. Uh, and we know that the original finial was in the form of St. George and the Dragon. For all Henry's credentials as a paragon of the Renaissance prince, this is a piece that is still steeped in the Gothic tradition, uh, and it must um, have been the overwhelming style of pieces, display pieces on show at banquets uh, in the early part of the reign. I say that because this range of ornaments, the red and white roses, the pomegranates, uh, and so on, uh, appear time and time again in the um, inventory descriptions, although the descriptions don't obviously describe style in the sort of terms that we would recognize. It was only in 1527, several years after the Field of Cloth of Gold, that Hans Holbein arrived in England, and we start to have a clear evidence of a new court style. Holbein is most remembered for his piercingly perceptive portraits uh, of the court, but um, he also provided designs for jewels and silver, such as this group from Basel. Holbein had an extraordinary facility for varying a theme, uh, as this group of four cup designs, or perhaps three cups and a spice plate, we don't know, um, and the one on the top perhaps gives a hint of the sort of vessels employed for the king's table a little after the field of cloth of gold. I think you'll agree that it's a vessel that gives the lie to Charles Lawton's complaint that refinement's a thing of the past. The epitome of Holbein's style as a designer of goldsmith's work is probably the, court, the gold cup he designed to mark Henry's marriage to Jane Seymour in 1536. This is uh, a design that uh, is in the British Museum. Uh, no, this is the one in the Ashmolean Museum. I'm just very careful with representatives of both here. This is the one from the Ashmolean, and there is a, a very similar um, version of that design in the, in the British Museum. It's set with pearls and rubies, and the cup is formed as a vase, carefully articulated into horizontal zones, and with each zone given its own distinctive ornament. This is all classical and contemporary. Flutes and gadroons, putti, dolphins, medallions, and arabesques. Gone are the Gothic motifs, the heraldic badges, and instead we have initials H and I for Henry and Jane, and Jane's personal motto, bound to obey uh, and serve. Where is that motto? There it is. You see right up at the top beneath the finial. And of course, being uh, Henry's wife, that's exactly what she was bound to do. Uh, the shield at the very top, left blank in the drawing, um, would have been enameled with the royal arms. Here is another detail um, showing the stem in all its extraordinary intricacy. The cup was melted down in 1620, one of the last surviving pieces of Henry VIII's jewel house. But we do have one piece that represents approximately the same aesthetic, uh, a remarkable salt in the Goldsmiths Company collection, this was made in Paris in about 1530 by Pierre Mango, the royal goldsmith. It's decorated with enamels and portrait medallions, and it would sit quite comfortably, I feel, alongside Holbein's cup. It appears to be listed in Henry's posthumous inventory, but how or exactly when it arrived in England is not certain. Conceivably, it was among the gifts that Francis exchanged with Henry when they met in 1532, although most gifts between kings would have been of gold, so perhaps not. Well, what can we conclude from all this? It's interesting that so many of the accounts of early Tudor banquets can be brought to life by Flemish, that is to say, Burgundian tapestries. But, what is perhaps, but, but that is perhaps because uh, Henry VII deliberately pursued a policy of emulating Burgundian court culture in this country. He appointed Flemish painters, poets, and even glaziers to court positions, um, and banquets, tournaments, and pageants all followed Burgundian precedent. They cost a fortune, and they were intended to impress by the wealth, culture, and magnificence of the monarch. Nor was it just the guests that got to see them. Privileged onlookers were always present, 
Uh, you can see them there, behind that screen, behind that sort of wall on the right-hand side. Um, and after the 1527 banquet that we've talked about, Henry ordered that the decorations and plate should be left up for three or four days that all honest persons might see and behold the houses and riches. The form and contents of these banquets varied, but the underlying message was always the same. Henry, or Francis for that matter, it made no difference, uh, was a man to be reckoned with and you were supposed to be dazzled. But the king was not only the head of state, he was the anointed of God and there was, as a result, a simmering religious substratum to these banquets. This came across through the Eucharistic ceremonies and the hierarchies, hierarchies of material, jeweled gold, plain gold, silver gilt, and so on, and hierarchies of form with covered cups and salts and spice plates outranking coverless ones. What you took away from one of these great occasions, you who were privileged enough to be present, was not just a sense of having had a jolly good evening, but a sense that you have been as close as one can be in this world to being in the divine presence. Charles Lawton would have been reassured. Refinement was far from being a thing of the past. Thank you.